Welcome to this online lesson on the start of the First World War. It'll be over by Christmas. Why did the opening of the First World War result in a stalemate? Of course, we know that this it'll be over by Christmas nonsense turned out to be just that, nonsense. Instead, the expectation of 1914 was broad open fields with cavalry charges gloriously defeating the enemy, as shown on the left, whereas the, the, the reality very quickly was that troops were very hurriedly digging trenches for their own safety as they could not break through the enemy lines. So consider this as a do-now task, especially if you've done one of my earlier videos on rapid-fire guns. Why do strong defensive weapons lead to a stalemate where nobody can win? If you want to have a go at that task, pause the video now. OK, what did we come up with? Well, remember, a stalemate is where neither side can win, but neither will they lose. Strong defensive weapons meant that the attacking weapons of rifles and later grenades were not powerful enough, usually on their own, to break through the strong defensive measures of more rifles, machine guns and heavy artillery. Not to mention the trench systems and barbed wire that soon characterised the First World War. But of course the war did not start like that, so we're going to have a look at some of the early stages and how the early uh, war of movement resulted in a stalemate eventually. First of all, some context. Here's two very ordinary people who experienced different aspects of medical care during World War I. Firstly, Sergeant Sidney Petherick. There he is in his pre-war Territorial Army uniform. Secondly, Private Josias Cole. He's only age 10 in the picture there, but I'd rather use a proper picture of Josias Cole rather than just a generic picture of the First World War soldier. He wasn't 10 when he was sent to war, I'm glad to say he was 21. Sergeant Petherick served for four years in the Middle East. It seems he was never wounded in all of that time. And as an infantry sergeant, that's a no mean feat. However, he died in Kantara Hospital on his way home in 1919, aged only 32, from flu, or what later became known as the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918-1919. Although his army records, as I've shown pictured, say that he died of wounds on that date. Who knows, perhaps his lungs had been damaged by the gas of the First World War and the flu finally killed him off. It's unlikely we will never know for sure. What's more clear-cut, though, is what happened to Private Josias Cole. Private Cole was wounded once, and only once, by shrapnel on March the 7th, 1917, aged 23. He died on his way to a dressing station, close to the front line, and was buried less than a mile away from where he died. We can see the record from the army there. Cole, Josias, 7th Battalion, the Duke of Cornwall's Light, Light Infantry, Private 28551, killed in action 7th of the 3rd, 1917. His father picked up his war pension in person. So, as a few tasks for you. What do these two stories tell us about the kinds of wounds that soldiers suffered in World War I? What do these stories tell us about the variety of dangers faced in World War I? And how would the medical treatment of these men have been different? Consider the type of problem and where it happened. Pause the video now. So some of the things you may have identified are as follows. Remember that sickness remained a serious threat for soldiers, as happened for Sergeant Petherick. Also in terms of the variety of dangers. It wasn't just about being shot at, there was artillery even before you got to the front line. And the medical treatment. Well, Private Josias Cole likely died before he could have been patched up, and he only went to a dressing station close to the front line, whereas Sergeant Petherick looks like he was in a proper field hospital for some days or even weeks before he died. So their experience of the First World War was really rather different, and yet their fate, sadly, was all too similar. To add to that context, a couple of more things I will reveal to you. Sergeant Petherick and Private Cole were ordinary, but they also happened to be my great-great-grandfather and great-great-uncle. Most people with British ancestry would find similar stories if they were able to research them, as so many British people served in the war and so many were in fact killed. The point is that this topic is about real people, not just about medical developments or not just about the warfare developments, about real people that are only a few generations removed from us right now. If your understanding of World War I is based upon computer games like Battlefield 1, as fun as they are, you will need to think again. So be aware of that. Let's move on to how the First World War commenced. Were the experiences of Sergeant Petherick and Private Cole typical 
Well, when dealing with sources, it is easy to generalise about World War I experiences. Sergeant Petherick served in the hot, dusty deserts and rocky coasts of Gallipoli in the Middle East. Private Cole endured the cold, wet, muddy trenches of France on the Western Front, which is a so much more famous experience of the First World War. So consider these statements within the next task. Explain how these generalised statements are in fact untrue. All soldiers in World War I served in the mud. All soldiers who died did so because they got wounded. World War I happened in France. Pause the video now and have a go at other di disproving those untrue statements. Hopefully you've, uh, you've identified that not all World War I soldiers died in the mud. In fact, so soldiers like Private, uh, sorry, Sergeant Pedrick served in the desert, where it was hot and dusty and not muddy at all. Others would have served at sea as part of the Royal Navy. Others might have served in the air with the Royal Flying Corps, Royal Naval Air Service, or what became the Royal Air Force. All soldiers died did so because they got wounded. Again, not true. Disease and its treatment was still very little advanced compared to what we have today. And so infections from minor wounds and indeed disease still took a lot of soldiers to their graves. And World War I happened in France. Again, completely untrue. World War I famously happened through a lot of France and France was invaded but it was also uh, took place in Belgium there were bombing raids in Germany and in Britain and indeed there were, were war fronts in Africa and across the oceans uh, and indeed in the Middle East so that the, the clue really is in the name it was a world war let's consider the British army at the start of the first world war this is a summary of Haldane's reforms of 1908 and the British Army of 1914, which was created by these reforms. I've compared it to the planned structure for this year, 2020, of the British Army, where there are some similarities and some distant differences. Have a read of the information in the table. The top column, or top row rather, looks at Haldane's structure of 1908, which divided the army into two distinct groups. First, the main group, the regular army. This is Britain's standing army, which was training and professional. Haldane planned a permanent force of 150,000 men. These could serve in the UK or be sent abroad as something called the British Expeditionary Force. This was in fact the force sent to France as the British Expeditionary Force in both the year 1914 and in 1939 for World War II. This force of 150,000 was tiny by the standards of the day. But remember British Britain's policy of having the Royal Navy to defend uh, the United Kingdom rather than relying on the uh, army as a last line of defence. To back this up, however, Haldane recognised that there might be the need for serious expansion at the start of the war. So the Territorial Force or Territorial Army was established. Haldane combined all the part-time and militia battalions into one force. It would only be called up in wartime and numbered 270,000. One of them was Sergeant Pre Pedrick, my great-great-grandfather. This was renamed the Territorial Army in 1920, uh, after the First World War. Now let's consider the army structure of 2020. It's actually quite a similar structure. The British Army uh, today has a regular standing army of full-time professional soldiers, which is planned to be reduced to 82,000 uh, men and women, of course, uh, by 2020. The Army Reserve, again comprising both men and women, uh, is the new name for the Territorial Army since 2013. These are still, though, part-time soldiers only called up in war, but they number only 30,000 troops. Your tasks, then. First of all, give one similarity between Haldane's structure and the Army in 2020. Secondly, give one difference. Thirdly, and as a challenge, explain how Haldane's reforms improved upon Cardwell's reforms. If you've not had a look at Cardwell's reforms in an earlier lesson looking at the outcomes of the Crimean War, it might be worth having a look at that before you attempt this. Lastly, what might be the problems with Haldane's army? If you're going to attempt those tasks, pause the video now. OK, let's see what you've come up with. Firstly, as a similarity, we should have identified that there is still a regular army and a part-time volunteer army. This is similar both in 1908 as it is in 2020, over 100 years later. However, there are several differences that you could pick from. For example, the size of the army is quite a lot smaller. The professional army is now 82,000 rather than 150,000 as it was in 1908. A more marked, marked difference, though, is the fact that the territorial army has been reduced from 270,000 to just 30,000. So, why? 
Well, part of it is because it's less seen that uh, the British army will need to have to fight a large war. Also, Britain no longer has a large empire that it needs to defend. But lastly, consider the impact of new technologies, which make individual soldiers and individual service people far more powerful and able to deal out far more destruction than could have ever been envisaged by people like Haldane, who were uh, restructuring the army in 1908. In terms of improving upon Cardwell's reforms, then, a lot of this is down to uh, efficiency. Consider that uh, Card uh, Cardwell's reforms uh, brought about the creation of local battalions or local regiments, um, which could be divided into three separate battalions, one serving abroad, one serving at home, and one reserve battalion that could be called up. By streamlining that and putting all of those reserve battalions into a territorial army, it became much clear how they could be uh, called upon and commanded in battle should the need arise. In terms of the problems then, well, it's quite an obvious one I would have thought. 150,000 men at this time is a very small army indeed. Should there be a major European war, hint, hint, 1914, there was, that army is going to be completely inadequate in size when ranged against the cons conscript armies of countries like Germany who could field millions of soldiers, not thousands. So let's have a look at how these two armies matched up at the start of the First World War. Let's have a look at the plan that Germany had formulated in order to attack France and win the First World War quickly. Spoiler alert, it didn't work, but it's interesting to note how Germany intended to do this. Before we go on though, I found this map because I thought it was quite clear, and I've since been able to notice that it's complete and utter rubbish. Uh, so sorry about that. Uh, a couple of mistakes that this map makes is Paris is, is, is too far north by about 100 miles, and Norwich is somewhere on the coast of Kent, which is very odd indeed given that Norwich is quite famously right in the centre of the country. So as long as we can ignore the inadequacies of the map, and it's too late for me to change it now I'm afraid, this should be able to uh, give us an idea of the Germans' plan. This was uh, created by a German general called Schlieffen, and so it became known as the Schlieffen Plan. It was recognised by the Germans that the French had fortified towns and fortresses all along the, uh, the border with Germany. If Germany was going to have a head-on attack towards these French forts, then it was going to lose pretty quickly. Instead, the Germans looked towards Belgium. Belgium was a neutral country which had been backed by treaties ever since the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. This meant that if anyone attacked Belgium, then other signatories of that treaty would join in to help, including France and the United Kingdom. Germany decided to gamble. It considered Belgium's army very small and incapable of mounting a defence, and even expected the Belgians to simply allow the Germans free passage through their lands. So here's their plan. Crash through Belgium quickly and surround Par Paris before the French are able to mount a counter-attack and defend their capital. Once the French had been soundly defeated and their centre of government captured, it was expected that the French would surrender pretty quickly. Your task then is to briefly summarise the Schlieffen, Schlieffen Plan's methods and objectives. Remember Germany was not going to attack the French head on, it was going to go through Belgium, capture Paris quickly before the French could uh, respond. If you want to make a note of the Schlieffen Plan now, pause the video. Done? Well, this is not what actually happened at the start of the First World War. The Schlieffen Plan came pretty close to success, but it didn't succeed for various reasons. Let's consider them now. Though this topic focuses on the British involvement in the Western Front from World War I to 1914 to 1918, uh, it's worth bearing in mind the uh, actions of other countries too. Germany's plan to invade France through Belgium and win quickly hadn't worked. The war began in August 1914, but by October there was a stalemate. Consider what stalemate means, and consider why the Schlieffen Plan didn't work. But first, describe the failure, and then explain why it failed. So if you turn your attention to my map again, you might notice one particular difference, and that is the British Expeditionary Force getting ready to leave for France. This they did. The British tended to take up positions in the north of the, uh, of the country of France. Not only that, it should be recognised that the Belgian army mounted a much stiffer defence than the Germans were expecting, which significantly delayed the Germans. As they approached through Belgium, they were delayed by the Belgians, by the, the British, and the French were able to reposition and mount a counter-offensive uh, during the Battle of the Marne. This was a horrendously destructive battle, but it succeeded in stopping the Germans from reaching Paris. Therefore, the combined eff efforts of the British, the Belgians, and probably most significantly, the French, resulted in the Germans being stopped. They could race south 
They could race north, but they were constantly being outflanked by the British and the French and the Belgians, who would quickly throw up defences in the form of trenches. This leads to a stalemate and a line of unbroken trenches and defence works that both sides built all the way from northern Belgium right the way down to the southern, uh, the southern parts of France and the border with Switzerland. And that's the stalemate. If you want to have a go at the tasks that are on this screen, pause the video now. If you want to know how the Germans are actually delayed, let's continue. We're going to look at one British example of how the Germans were delayed. That's not just because I am British, uh, it's because this uh, particular course that I've designed this with considers the development of the British Army over others. However, look at the photograph. This shows two British regular soldiers who would have been part of the professional British Expeditionary Force looking incredibly tired and battle-weary, and indeed, indeed one of them looks wounded, after a battle called the Battle of Mons. Behind them are a couple of Belgian soldiers who also took part in the defence. If we look at the map down the bottom, we can see where Mons is. The battle began on the 22nd of August 1914, only a few weeks after Britain had declared war. Notice that by the 23rd of August, the British positions had been pushed out of the city. This was a humiliating defeat for the British, who had expected to hold the town of Mons because of the defensive line of the river and canal uh, just, just to the north of the city. But they were massively outnumbered by the first German army under von Kluck, who was no chicken, let me tell you. The tiny British army was quickly pushed back, and they, but they were able to hold the Germans up. So one place they did this for around a day was at Mons in Belgium. If you look back at the lesson I did on rapid-fire guns, or if you already have some knowledge of um, First World War weaponry, you might be able to have a go at these questions here. What sorts of weapons would the British be using in the defence of Mons? I'll give you a little bit of a hint. They were able to bottle the Germans into specific river crossings by blowing up bridges all along the canal. Secondly, write a point example explain paragraph to answer this. Why were the Germans delayed at Mons? As a hint, remember the power of defensive weapons. I can also recommend the BBC Our World War series, the first episode of which gives a very realistic and uh, well-produced and indeed a quite exciting and entertaining uh, version of the Battle of Mons, which gives you quite a good idea of how the, the British were able to mount such a stiff resistance, even in a doomed cause. So if you want to have a look at those resources or have a look at my lesson on rapid-fire guns before attempting these questions, that is perfectly fine. If not, pause the video now and attempt the questions. All right, what did we come up with? We should have been able to identify that British would have been using machine guns based upon the Maxim design, specifically the Vickers machine gun. Also remember the British soldiers were armed with Lee Enfield bolt action rifles. They were specially trained to fire these both accurately and at a very high rate of fire between 20 and 30 bullets, and these are not just random shots, aimed shots within a minute. This meant that the Germans trying to cross the bridges and get into Mons would have to face a hail of bullets, even though the British army were massively outnumbered by the Germans. Not only that, British artillery could be used, but at Mons, the artillery was ineffective. It wasn't called forward um, fast enough, and the German artillery was far more powerful. So why were the Germans delayed at Mons? Well, really, it's because of the power of well-aimed and well-operated rifles, machine guns, and artillery, especially when focused upon points of weakness in the line and those bridges across to Mons. So we're going to consider the wider reasons for the stalemate next. Create a spider diagram on a piece of paper or on your computer like this. Why was there a stalemate in 1914? With one section on powerful new weapons, one section on outdated weapons, another section on old-fashioned tactics, and a last section on evenly matched sides. You might prefer to make these different colours in order to make it more eye-catching, but I'm trying to keep this nice and simple for you when you're looking at it on the screen. Pause the video now and create the basis of your spider diagram. Done? Okay, let's start adding some examples to it. Add these factors to the correct part of a diagram, either powerful new weapons, outdated weapons, old-fashioned tactics, and evenly matched sides. Pause the video while you add these on. Done? Well, let's go through some examples. Machine guns should go under powerful new weapons. Britain's army was small but well-trained, and Germany's army was large but less well-trained, actually suggests evenly matched sides, where a small but well-trained army might be able to take on a larger but less well-trained one. 
heavy artillery cannon. These are also powerful new weapons. German soldiers also attacked head-on, much as they might have done a century earlier. This is, is related to old-fashioned tactics. Spotter planes were also used crucially in the defence of, uh, for example, Paris during the Battle of the Marne, where they spotted German troop movements. This is an example of a powerful new weapon. Both sides used horses. horses. These were outdated weapons. Cavalry by this point were clearly outmatched by modern artillery, as has been shown at the Battle of Balaclava 60 years earlier, and of course by this point by the use of machine guns. Cavalry swords and lances were also outdated weapons. France and Germany had similar sized armies, which shows that they were evenly matched sides. Accurate rifles were part of powerful new weapons. And cavalry charges didn't work even though they were tried. This shows old-fashioned tactics. And all sides used similar weapons, which also shows evenly matched sides. Most importantly though, neither side won. Most of all, showing evenly matched sides. Let's put this together. Why was there a stalemate in 1914? Use a point example explain paragraph with at least two examples from your diagram to explain your answer. If you want to attempt that, pause the video now. Okay, let's see how you got on. World War I became a stalemate in 1914. One reason for this is, an example for this is, this meant neither side could win because. Another reason for the stalemate was, an example of this is, this meant that neither side could win because. Well, consider these examples again, consider the question, and now make any improvements that you need to based upon the writing frame that I've shown here. If you're happy with your answer, how might Britain try and break the stalemate and win? Would this idea be possible in 1914? Give that some thought and pause the video now, or simply move on. Okay, whichever stage you're at, we'll move on. We're now going to consider trench warfare. If you're able to get a copy of a picture like this, and you can find them on Google pretty easily, or if you want to draw one yourself, this would be a useful way of setting about it. Each side quickly discovered that they could not overpower their enemies, and they so they began to dig in for cover. Very quickly, lines of trenches developed, stretching all the way from the Belgian coast at Newport to the Swiss border. The diagram below shows a typical front-line trench. This one is more typical of British designs. The German ones, I'm sorry to say, were often quite a lot better than this. Your tasks. Make a copy of the diagram in your book and explain the following what the following features were for. First of all, the fire step, the duck boards and sump, the dugout and the parapet. Four. How well protected would a, would a soldier be from enemy snipers, bombs and artillery? Explain your answers. Pause the video now. OK, well, here's some answers for you. The fire step enables a soldier to stand up and look over the top of the parapet and fire his gun at approaching enemies. It's a step on which you can fire your gun, a fire step. The duckboards and sump are designed to limit the amount of flooding and to provide drainage for the trench and keep it dry, although this was often inadequate given the weather conditions and the landscape of the First World War. The dugout is an emergency refuge. If soldiers hear incoming artillery, they can dive into that very quickly and protect themselves better. The parapet is one final line of defence that just lifts the, the um, edge of the trench above the soldier's head height, but also provides a rest for the soldier to fire his gun from while still maintaining some cover. Originally, a parapet was the top of a castle wall, and this is where it gets its idea. Sandbags, rem uh, remember, are very effective at stopping bullets as they dissipate the energy from a bullet when they hit there. So how well protected would a soldier be from enemy snipers? Well, presuming he doesn't stand on the fire step and, and put his head over too often, he's very well protected from enemy snipers. If you got shot by a sniper in the First World War, you were pretty unlucky or you'd been a bit careless. Either that or there was damage to the trench and the Germans uh, or British uh, snipers had managed to get uh, a downward view on their enemy. What about bombs and artillery? Well, actually, again, pretty effective. There was nothing you could do if an artillery shell landed directly in the trench, but if it landed to either side of there, assuming the trench held up to the, to the blast, a soldier would be quite well protected. As we'll see in a future diagram, uh, trenches were specially shaped as well to prevent the blast of uh, artillery shells from spreading too far throughout a trench. Let's move on. The trench system was built as follows, and each side built networks of trenches to provide deeper defences and to support the soldiers on the front line. This diagram, drawn by yours truly, shows a typical British trench system. Alright, it's not one of my better drawings, but you get the idea. 
Firstly, you've got the front line trench. This is the one which is most heavily fortified and is nearest the enemy. Notice the shape of it, a zigzag design, almost looking like the top of a castle wall. Well, this meant that, first of all, if an artillery shell landed in there, only one section would be affected by the blast really badly. Also, if an enemy soldier got into the trench, they would not be able to fire all the way down along it. They would have to fight for every single corner, which was easier for the defender. Then we've got the command trench. This is situated about 20 metres behind the front line trench. The command trench includes the main dugouts and also support structures like machine gun bunkers. Lastly, we've got communications trenches. These link the trenches together. Not quite lastly, actually, there's one other I've forgotten. The support trench right at the back. This might be 200 metres away from the front line. This contains the headquarters where officers will be able to make their plans. This is where reserve troops would be kept who could relieve the men in the front line. It included the latrines, the dressing stations for first aid and so on and so forth. The thing is, these uh, trench systems could be used in depth. Should the first line of trenches fall, then there would be other trenches behind which could still blunt any attack and potentially stop it. Let's just consider something. Spotted planes could spy on troop numbers and movements. There was no cover in these trenches to prevent them from spotting this. Also, there were artillery craters. The zigzag trenches did do some good in, in terms of protecting the soldiers from some blast. But let's just imagine something's gone wrong, and there is a wounded man here. Note where the, the rear area and dressing station is. Consider how confusing it would be getting the wounded man from that frontline trench back to the dressing station. This was a difficult and dangerous task, and many soldiers would die before they got back there. Your tasks then. Firstly, make your own copy of this diagram, or if you're able to print this, do it. Label your copy of the diagram and then describe the trench system. What parts are there? Explain. Explain how the parts of the system could support each other. And then consider this wounded man. What is the shortest route that he could be carried to get to the dressing station in the support trench? Describe it using the correct words and vocabulary associated with the trenches. As an extension, what obstacles and dangers are there along the way? Explain how they would threaten the man's survival. If you want to attempt those tasks, pause the video now. Right, what did you come up with? Well, hopefully we've been able to identify the correct parts of the trenches, as I have labelled. And you might be able, well be able to explain how they support each other. For example, you've got re reinforcement troops who are in the support trench who can be sent forward in the event of an attack. And the command trench is much closer to the front line, allowing effective communications between those in the dugouts and machine gun bunkers and those in the front line defences. There's more you could mention than that, I am sure. In terms of the shortest route back for the man, they would have to carry on along the uh, front line trench, then take a right turn into one of the communications trenches, another right turn into the uh, along the the command trench, sorry, and then a left turn down another communications trench and then another left turn down the support trench before a final right turn and getting into the dressing station. What I hope I've communicated to you here is that without being able to see a top-down view of this, these trenches could become a bit like a maze and it was not unusual for soldiers to get quite lost in them. Therefore, these uh, different trenches were often given names. Very often, the uh, soldiers that built them named them after streets uh, that would remind them of home. We're now going to consider the conditions in the trenches and how grim life was for soldiers in here. At the same time, we're going to try and bust a few myths about this, though. Much of World War I was characterised by this static trench warfare, with static, strong defences on both sides. Soldiers spent about 15% of their time in the front-line trench, 40% of their time in command or support trenches, and 45% of their time resting behind the lines. This idea of uh, soldiers being sent to the trenches and then staying there until they went mad, were wounded or were killed is a myth. All time in the front line would have been deeply unpleasant, but it made up a reasonably small proportion of the time for the soldiers to be in there, but with very good reason. Question 7. Why would soldiers spend so little time in the front line? Look for clues in the diagrams and photos that you've already studied. OK, hopefully we've identified that the conditions in the frontline trenches would have been so appalling that no one would want to spend there any more time there. Even British commanders of the First World War recognised that it was a big ask to expect soldiers to spend any more than a week at a time in the frontline trenches. 
Any more than that, soldiers would become too fatigued, they wouldn't be able to rest and sleep properly, and they could pick up injuries. And so a regular rotation of soldiers in the front line was necessary in order to keep the men fighting effectively. Let's move on. Here are some more sources that give us a few hints about conditions in the trenches and conditions of the First World War in general. We'll look at each source in turn, and then I'm going to set some tasks based upon this. Source A is the photograph to the left and in the centre. A stretcher bearer is trying to cross no man's land near Ypres, which is in Belgium, with thick mud and flooded shell holes all around them. Consider how difficult this would have been. Source B is at the top right. Scots stretcher bearers trying to help a man through a crowded trench. Given the equipment of the Scots and the state of the trench, this is likely to have been taken in the first year or so of the war. Lastly, source C. A description of travelling through the trenches by a British soldier. Although people talk about communications trenches and duckboards, they generally weren't there. And if they were there, there was every prob probability that the enemy might be going to shell them. So going along a trench at night meant stumbling along a dark, wet ditch with an irregular floor and a right uh, angle turn every few yards so that you can't see where you're going. To manoeuvre these things, these heavy bundles of barbed wire round a corner, was so fatiguing it can hardly be described. So you'd go cursing and stumbling along in the dark, slipping into holes and stumbling over wires. Worst of all was the traffic problem, because there would be several parties of this kind going through the labyrinth of trenches, and you could have a jam as bad as a London traffic jam. Let's consider these sources. Look at sources A, B and C. What problems were created by the trenches, the surrounding terrain, and the... And the I'll read that again. The trenches, the terrain surrounding them for soldiers fighting or moving in battle. How useful is source C for someone wanting to understand the conditions in the trenches? For this, consider the author. Who wrote it? The provenance, consider how typical the source may be of that experience. And then evaluate it. Explain the uses and limitations of that source. You might want to spend between 10 and 15 minutes on these tasks. And if you do, pause the video now. Hopefully we've recognised that the terrain of the First World War was very challenging. The low-lying areas of places like Belgium often became flooded whenever it rained and the artillery would churn up all sorts of thick mud. Men could literally drown in this. Not only that, the geography of the trenches themselves, being so narrow, narrow and crowded, meant that any movement uh, through them of any speed was virtually impossible. In terms of the usefulness of Source C then, let's consider the author first of all. Although we don't have the, author, the author's name, we are told that this is a British soldier, so presumably someone who experienced this firsthand and give us an accurate idea of what their experience was. Well, let's then consider how typical this source may be. Well, if we compare source C to source B, we can see the difficulty of moving down the trenches. This means that source B backs up what is said in source C. In other words, it corroborates it or gives similar information. So it is likely to be quite typical. Lastly, the, the uh, uses and the limitations. Well, while this gives a pretty vivid account of what the, uh, the conditions and what the difficulties of moving through the trenches were like, it doesn't tell us whether this is completely the same across the entire Western Front or whether this is just the experience of one particular soldier. Also, it kind of focuses largely on what it was like to move in the dark. Well, would it have been easier in the light? In the light? Well, it's, it's difficult to know because this source simply doesn't tell us. But overall, how useful is it? Well, hopefully you have identified that this is actually quite a useful source. We can trust the author, who was someone who was there and describing their own personal experiences. We can see from other sources that it is likely that this is a typical experience, and that although it's limited in terms of telling us what it was like during the daytime, its uses outweigh these limitations, making it overall a pretty useful source. And I would add to that that the examiner will probably never give you a source that is not useful. It's very difficult to decide how, use, how good a historian is if you're giving them sources which are useless. So just remember that. We're now going to have a look at some examples of conditions in the trenches. You might want to make some notes about uh, each of these different dangers. The first we're going to have a look at is trench fit. Soldier Harry Roberts descri describes trench fit. If you've never had trench fit described to you, I will explain. Your feet swell to two to three times their normal size and go completely dead. You can stick a bayonet into them and not feel a thing. If you are lucky enough not to lose your feet and then the swelling starts to go down, it is then that the most indescribable agony begins. I have heard men cry and scream with pain and many have had to have their feet and legs amputated. I was one of the lucky ones, but one more day in that trench and it may have been too late. I'm going to show some pretty disgusting pictures of trench foot now. <laughs> 
Uh, if you'd prefer to look away from these, it will be worth skipping the, the rest of the video. So on the left, we can see a soldier who's had part of their feet amputated and indeed one of their toe bones is sticking out of the rotting flesh. Unfortunately, the uh, modern antibiotics hadn't been invented at this time. And so once these flesh eating bacteria got into your foot, amputation was very often the only way of combating it. Though it should be recognised that soldiers were, did make an effort to keep clean and that trench foot of the extremity of this was reasonably rare for the majority of soldiers. On the right, we can actually see the swelling is so bad that the dead flesh of the toes has been pushed off of the bone entirely. This soldier would likely have found their toes at the very least being amputated, if not more of the foot. One way of imagining trench foot is if you've ever spent too long in the bath and your fingers and toes have gone all wrinkly and the, the skin all brittle, well, imagine if you were in the trenches unable to get your feet dry and they were like that for days at a time in filthy conditions. You can see how the skin would split and how infections could, uh, could spread easily. Let's look at another aspect now. Eric Remarque, a German soldier. He later wrote a famous book called All Quiet on the Western Front. We most looked out for our bread. The rats have become more numerous lately because the trenches are no longer in good condition. The rats here are particularly repulsive. They are so fat, the kind we call corpse rats. They have shocking, evil, naked faces and it is nauseating to see their long, nude tails. All right, apologies for the accent there. But what can we learn about the experience of having to share your trench with rats? Make some notes based upon this source now. When you're ready to move on, we'll look at another danger. This is not so much as a danger as a real nuisance and an inconvenience. This photograph shows German soldiers de-lousing. I'd also ask you to note how well built this German trench is. Typically, German trenches were better than the British ones. There is quite a logical reason for this. The Germans were expecting to stay put and simply challenge the British and the French to hurl themselves against their well-prepared defences. After all, they had invaded France and Belgium, and it was up to the Allies to, to boot them out of those countries. And so they built their trenches with a much greater mind in terms of permanence. Indeed, some of their dugouts even had electric lighting. Many homes in Britain at that time could not boast the same thing. I've also shown a microscopic image of a typical body louse. Notice its sharp claws on its, uh, on its feet, which help it to crawl around the body, but also cause great irritation, not to mention its blood sucking. De-lousing was an almost constant process, and it was very difficult to successfully do it. Nevertheless, soldiers who were often bored would sit about removing these little lice, which they would call chats. So as they sat about, they would have a chat. Well, that's one possible origin of that phrase anyway. Note that the German soldier is still keeping a, a bit of a lookout. The ways that the soldiers used to try and remove the lice were various. Firstly, the lice would gather in the seams and, uh, and lay eggs. These could be crushed between the fingernails. Alternatively, a flame like a candle could be run along the seams of your clothes and you'd hear the, the snap, crackle and pop, not of your Rice Krispies, but of the, the lice being burnt. Although you'd have to be careful not to singe your clothes. Ultimately, though... A deep clean was the only way of removing lice from these uniforms and very often the soldiers were unable to get that until they were able to return behind the lines and get a new uniform issued or able to get their uniforms properly laundered. And so for most soldiers they simply had to put up with it. The itching and the irritation and the sometimes fevers and infections that the lice could call, cause would leave you feeling truly lousy. The last piece we're going to look at is a rather unpleasant image. And again, I make no apology for showing this uh, because we need to understand just how unpleasant much of First World War history is. However, I will ask you to use this image uh, in a way that allows you to understand the horrors and dangers of the trenches. If you'd prefer not to look at this, I would skip the rest of the video. Here we see a dead French soldier uh, taken during the Battle of Verdun. It's pretty shocking stuff. His eyeballs have been eaten out by rats and the skin on the face is starting to become bleached and stretched back over the teeth. And yet his horribly broken body is a sight that many soldiers would simply have to put up with. Not only that, there would be the disgusting smell of so many corpses in no man's land that simply couldn't be retrieved. This is one reason why there were so many missing soldiers from the First World War who were simply never recovered. The battlefields would simply overrun their final resting places and their bones are still being found in the French and Belgian fields to this day. Soldiers would deal with this in a variety of ways. Some would simply try to ignore it. 
Others would become desensitized to it, which has its own mental health problems. Others didn't cope so well at all, and I don't think we can really blame them. And a few would have even used dark humour in order to overcome it. There is a story of one British trench with a rotting arm sticking out the side of the trench. An observer noted how some soldiers would ignore that arm, and others would shake its hand, and others would even ask it for the time. These are all ways of the soldiers removing themselves from the horror of what they were experiencing. And it's often as historians that we need to face up to this so that we do not learn a sanitised version of what was a really horrible period in history. We'll move on to the final task now. Finally, give three examples of the challenges and dangers of the trenches. You'll want to spend about a minute on this. Then explain why powerful defensive weapons led to a stalemate. Spend about a minute on that as well. And lastly, give one way that the stalemate might eventually be broken. This might well relate to new technologies, which will be covered in future lessons. Pause the video while you complete these things, and on that note, I'll say thank you very much for watching. I hope it's been useful, and if it has, give this video a like, and consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks very much, and goodbye.